Fraud and cybersecurity are now the major issues to address or combat for organizations, financial institutions, and even individuals worldwide. With me is security industry heavyweight Don Randall, MBA Cyber Ambassador for the Bank of England and Senior Advisor with Security Risk and Law Experts, Pilgrims Group and by Vonus Law to discuss the threats and precautions. Don, with the increase of business and banking, well, pretty much everything now being done online, has this really opened the floodgates for fraud? If you go back to the ATM frauds of the 80s, actually that was electronic fraud. It was, you know, you were using technology to commit fraud if you deceive the ATM into who it is. The, the methods are more sophisticated these days, so it's made it more global and easier to do and more difficult to detect. Well, in February, news broke that up to 100 banks and financial institutions worldwide had been attacked by what they called an unprecedented cyber robbery. So is this the shape of things to come? What were the losses? Were they reputational losses? Were they financial losses? What was the motivation behind those attacks? That's what I think we have to do. And through this morning, I think we'll talk about motivation, because I think if we understand motivation, it actually will allow people to be more preventative, more understanding, and actually detect and deter these types of attacks. Well, a lot of countries are coming out of recession, and with austerity cuts, that means perhaps less is being spent on things for security. What sort of impact has this had, and is this the case? If we look at the, the reduction in policing finance, clearly that causes a refocus of prioritisation. Um, uh, perhaps fraud goes down the uh, agenda on some chief officers, but there's been centralisation. You know, the City of London Police are the National Fraud Investigation Bureau. They are the single repository for cybercrime. So I think there's been a refinement of the focus, action fraud, which some people, you know, Stephen Greenhoff once said, this non-action fraud. You know, that now sits with the City Police since April last year. But more importantly, I think we have to work harder and work towards supporting authority in the prevention, detection and evidence of cyber attack and the packages that go together. So you wanted to talk about motivation. Do you think the government's doing enough to combat these sort of attacks and this sort of fraud, you know, considering the amount of financial losses that they represent? Move away from the financial losses. We're going to look at the impact, the impact on individuals. You know, I always used to say when I first investigated fraud, if my mum lost five pounds, that was her weak ruin, yes? Whereas a major institution could lose five million pounds, it's not particularly happy, but it doesn't cause it to stop actually working. I think when I talk about motivation, I'm not talking about the government's motivation, I'm talking about the motivation of the, the criminal or the perpetrator of the cyber attack. That's what I'm meaning on the motivation. I actually think the government, you know, the 10 steps of cyber produced by effectively CPNI, which is the outfacing of, of MI5 and GCHQ, uh, there's the SANS 20 steps. So I think government are really trying to do, address this, but it's down to the individual organisations and institutions to interpret what they're being told and also use you know, private security companies or law firms to assist them in what they're doing. So you're heavily involved in security training. What sort of things are we looking at? Since I took over the Chief Information Security Officer role at the Bank of England, on I actually created an education and awareness team. I think you have to educate. You cannot deal as a, as a CISO or CISO, whichever way you express it, if, you, if, you're, if your own colleagues are not detecting the attacks. You know, a phishing attack, a malware attack, uh, a spam attack. What do you do with it? Even if you look at your own company here, what do you do with it? If something looks unusual, where do you put it? Who do you go to? Or do you just delete it? So how do we actually understand? So I think we've got to go down an education awareness. I think law enforcement have to be educated. I think also we have to get into the private security world and ensure that there's adequate training. I was talking to the head of the National Crime Agency only yesterday and how we need in the private sector to be evidentially equivalent of a detective so that we can produce the evidential package that will actually sustain a prosecution, scrutiny, appeal and challenge. Do you think the problem is the lack of punishments for cyber robbery, cyber crime, that sort of thing? Because I think that people nowadays, they can sort of steal a huge amount of money, but you know they won't get that much time in prison or that, there won't be that many penalties. If you go back in history, and we talk about the Crays and the Richardsons, you know, why rob a bank and hurt someone when you get 20 years in prison? Whereas if you move to fraud, you can get more money and less punishment. And it's harder to convict. And, and that's back in the 70s and 80s. I don't think you'll ever reverse that. I don't think you'll ever, ever get... And I don't know how you do the equation, to be honest. As I said, my mum with five pounds or HSBC with five million. How would you do an equation that could reflect a punishment unless you put it into more emotional? And you say, well, this was actually hurting 
society hurting ordinary people, not institutions. But even if you have that argument, the institutions feed the ordinary people. So I would not be an advocate of going down the, the punitive route. Now on to security issues and how they relate to real world terrorist threats. Are large organisations targeted? And are we talking money laundering or something more sinister? Terrorist groups are using cyber as a propaganda tool, as a recruitment tool, let alone as a, a money laundering tool. That's not new. If we go back to the days of Irish terrorism, there was money laundering through terrorist activity. You know, whether it be on the streets of New York and getting funds in and they're going back to to the IRA in those days. So I, I think that's always been, I think what the financial sector has to do is be alert to that. And we have to create a mechanism where they can share suspicion as well as actual. And that, that has changed with the creation of the National Crime Agency, because there is now an opportunity in legislation where financial institutions can report suspicions as well as actuals. There's a gateway now. And the Home Secretary launched an initiative last June um, where they were looking to have greater cooperation, greater information sharing between the banks and authority. So finally, how do you see security issues developing over the next few years? I see a greater involvement in the private sector. When you look at the emotive crimes of this country, the murders, the rapes, the paedophilia, that sort of stuff, you know, fraud is never going to be higher than those. I don't think we'd want it to be higher than those. So I think that on the scale of response, it's going to put more and more onus on the private sector to actually prevent detect, package and pass over. <laughs>